Hello and welcome to another exclusive interview as part of the Excellence series, where we dig into life, see what we can find to become more excellent with greater clarity. My name is Scott Kokenauer. I'm your host, and I'm so glad you've taken time out to tune in. My guest today is Marilyn Donnellan. Marilyn is a modern Renaissance woman. Uh, she's an artist, a writer, a wife, a mother, a grandmother. She also has a successful career as a nonprofit CEO and consultant. Uh, her more than 60 books, guides, webinars, and training tools are in use in over a dozen countries worldwide. A sought-after speaker and trainer, uh, Marilyn's background and skills provide a backdrop for a wide range of topics. Marilyn, what an honor. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity, Scott. Well, it's good to it's good to meet you, and let's get started right away here with a little bit about Marilyn. Uh, okay. so where did you grow up? What did you want to be when you grew up? I actually grew up on a farm slash ranch in eastern Oregon. Uh, rode horses, fed cows, pigs, all that wonderful stuff, and um, I just really enjoyed my childhood. It was great opportunity. Well, well, great. And uh, what what did you want to be when you, you know, what did you always aspire to be? Well, that kind of ties in with my farming background because one of the things we used to do was butcher a steer on a regular basis for me. And they always gave me the heart to dissect. Oh. And so I wanted to be a heart surgeon, and this was about the time or shortly before they were doing open heart surgeries, and it was just really an exciting time. Wow. So that's kind of what I wanted to do, but life takes you in wide range of circles. And so I've actually had about 10 different careers, uh, everything from engineering to real estate to um selling travel trailers so oh. all right well that's interesting do you have any particular childhood memory that that jumps out at you with fondness uh yeah in fact i was thinking about this the other day with all the snow that those of you in the northeast are experiencing now you're in florida right uh, i'm in florida okay. now okay. i had enough of that um <laughs> i'm done with snow Okay, so. Anyway, uh, when I would go out to feed the cows and the horses, I had a cat called Snowball, who was white, who would wrap himself around my neck and keep my neck warm while I was doing the chores. Okay. <laughs> so that was kind of a fond memory that I always think about when it's winter time and snowing. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, well, well cool. Let, let's move into... Um, the the meat of, a, of what I want to talk about here. Late, late uh, October last year, you released a book called The Virtually Nimble Nonprofit. Correct. Okay. Um, so what was the spark that ignited your desire to write such a book? Um, the biggest spark, Scott, was the fact that I had a client at the time, a consulting client, who was struggling to put on a virtual conference. This was uh, scheduled for May of last year after the pandemic really hit. Mm -hmm. And this was a large national association with over 7,000 members. Mm -hmm. And I started asking questions, what worked, what didn't work. Then I interviewed a couple more uh, organizations and that's kind of how the book started because I realized the wealth of information that I was getting from these clients and these individuals could be of great help to the sex to the sector. And interestingly enough, a lot of the principles will apply to for-profit businesses as well as not-for-profits. Now, not-for-profit, I'm sure, has been impacted by the coronavirus, all, all of the restrictions and everything. So your experience has been in nonprofits, right? Correct. Uh, prior to getting into nonprofits in the early 80s, I had my own business. Uh, I had worked in a wide variety of careers, uh, engineering, tech, retail sales, etc. 
So I had a really good working knowledge of business practices, mm -hmm. but it wasn't until I got into my first nonprofit, which by the way was a single staff organization, that means me, <laughs> I had to learn the nonprofit business from the bottom up very literally. And that's when I began to pay attention to what are the strategies? What are the things I can do with limited budget, limited resources to still be excellent in all aspects of the organization? Mm -hmm. So that kind of built that whole lifetime effort of looking for ways to do what I did better and then starting to share that with my colleagues. Uh, give us a little insight into the book. Um, for the nonprofit executive director who's listening and is trying to figure out how best to communicate to his or her board, uh, are there ways to use virtual? Oh, yes. And in fact, um, to, to extend a little further into the question that you asked me earlier about nonprofits and the whole virtual switch, Mm -hmm. Many of them have greatly struggled with how to move to virtual platforms and strategies. And I'm sure that's very true in the for-profit sector as well. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned, and I've experienced this in the five organizations where I served as CEO as well, is that there is a strong component of being a change agent and planning ahead. Um, that if you don't plan, if you aren't willing to step outside that proverbial box, then you are going to really struggle when something hits you like the pandemic. And the organizations that I've interviewed and worked with in the past year in this virtual world, the ones who are succeeding are the ones who are change agents who are thinking outside the box, who are establishing plans, who aren't afraid, afraid to try new things, who are able to lead their board of directors into different ways of doing business. Mm -hmm. For example, if you are providing programs to youth, let's say an athletic program, how do you do that virtually? <laughs> do you go you know, do you shut down the organization until you can come back and do on-site programs? What's happening is that many of these organizations are looking for ways to still interact with their students, with their clients virtually. For example, I heard of one that I thought was really terrific. What they did was um, they had soccer games. Well, they can't how do you do soccer games virtually? Right. What they did is they found a software package that teaches soccer and they worked with their students virtually to help them learn the principles and the moves for soccer. And I thought that was extremely yes. creative. Yes. Creative, open-minded. Uh, yeah. You know, I saw a post just this morning on LinkedIn where there's a graph and there are two lines, one's going down, one's going up. And, and the point was businesses, organizations are either dying or they're getting better. There's no kick the can down the road. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, one of the things I like to do is read outside my expertise and outside my sector. So one of my favorites is the uh, MIT magazine that they put out every couple of months. And there was an article in there just this last month that said the very same thing, that in order for organizations, regardless of the type, to survive, they have to be willing to change. And they also have to reevaluate re how they are measuring success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I thought was very interesting and definitely ap applies across every sector. So if you were running a nonprofit right now, what would be one of the uh, measurements of success that you would need to have? Well, that actually gets into the whole 
look at the infrastructure and functions of the organization. I recommend in my book that you develop a virtual committee that the board appoints, and then they start looking at virtual platforms and strategies for everything from fundraising to marketing to programs to accounting. Mm -hmm. How do you do that offsite? What do we need to outsource? And by looking at all of those core functions as a planning group and then saying, okay, we're going to switch to a virtual pl platform, but how do we measure if it's effective or not? Mm -hmm. And establishing those metrics, which you can do even on an accounting side, mm -hmm. measuring income to expenses, what is the ratio? How has that been impacted by virtual strategies? So that's just one example okay. of many that we talk about in the book. What's your favorite chapter in that book? Oh, my favorite chapter. I would have to say probably develop the virtual nonprofit strategic plan. Mm. Because if you don't plan and you, you aren't conscious of what you need to do and then develop strategies to get there, everything else just falls apart. Mm -hmm. And I would have to say with my many years of experience with hundreds of organizations of different types and sizes, there are two things that are arbiters of success in my opinion. One of those is training the board on their legal governance responsibilities. It's scary when you think that these board members are legally liable for the decisions they make and don't make, and yet they're not trained on hmm. what that means and how to do it. That's right. And the second factor is strategic planning. Now, don't roll your eyes on me, Scott, here. <laughs> I won't do that because I am a firm believer in being strategic. <laughs> a lot of people hate the idea of strategic planning. They see it as this year or two year long plan. It takes forever. It's complicated. They get the plan, put it on the shelf because it's already outdated. <laughs> right. Well, I actually developed a simplified process that won an award several years ago for innovation, whereby I can guide a board through a planning session in six hours, and they end up with a one-year measurable, workable strategic plan. Mm. So... We have to think differently in today's virtual world right. on how we do our planning. We can't say, well, you know, we're going to plan for a year on how to switch to virtual strategies. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to work. Already lost. Yep. You have to have in place the strategies that will allow you to adapt and be flexible, or as we say in the book, to be nimble to quickly make those adjustments because your goal, your mission is to meet the needs of the clients right. and they're not going to wait. If no. you're not going to meet their needs, they're going to go somewhere else. Just away. like a for-profit would do. Hmm. If you don't meet the needs of the customers, they're gone. Hmm. And the same thing applies to nonprofit clients as well. Now you mentioned that you consult. Um, is there, Besides writing and consulting, what else do you do for your clients? Um, I do a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I recently did a series of classes for a nonprofit web advisor on the core competencies of a successful nonprofit. Um, because often executives, directors are hired for fundraising skill or program skills, but they have no clue about internal controls or don't understand marketing. So of these types of webinars, I do more and more of them um, because of the fact that they really help people. And remember, they're virtual. Mm -hmm. So they are helping individuals to develop the skills that they need. Um, besides the webinars, I also have a group of what are called authorized dealers. 
Um, these are listed under my resource section on the website that you just showed. Mm -hmm. These are consultants across the United States who use a, and promote the materials that I've developed. Uh, in particular, the series called Nonprofit Management Simplified, which covers all aspects of nonprofit management. Okay. These, these consultants can use that material. They're authorized to use it. And they can also sell it and make a little commission off of it as well. Okay. So as I'm moving toward retirement age, these wonderful authorized dealers um, have the opportunity to carry on this legacy that I think is really important for nonprofits. Sure. Now let's let's. Um, I, I want to find out a little bit more about your writing. Yes. As well. You've got some fiction books. Right. Yes, I've had a lot of fun with that. A couple of years ago, I decided just for the fun, I was going to do that. So the first one was the Give Till It Hurts book, which is a murder mystery based on domestic violence issues. OK. And then the next ones are the four book series, kind of a dystopian type, like mm -hmm. Handmaid's Tale. It's called The Book Liberators. OK. And it's a four book series where... <laughs> Uh, it, it's based on the concept, I got this idea actually from online, where they were talking about planning, implanting chips uh, mm -hmm. to track people, mm -hmm. their health data and so on. So I carried that a little further and said, what if the government required intelligence chips, transaction mm -hmm. chips, uh, behavioral chips? And in this scenario, um, the United States has switched to an empire after World War III, and uh, people are being forced to have these implants, and libraries and books are being destroyed. Okay. So this young college student decides to start this rebel group called the Book Liberators. Wow. That, that <laughs> you are a, a wide range of interests and abilities. Uh, there, so those of you listening to the podcast or watching this video, you, you've got everything you need to lead your organization, right? right. Uh, a number of 60 books, um, lots of different resources. Plus, in your off time, you've got <laughs> reading. So Marilyn can speak into your life in a lot of different areas. And uh, so that is is very powerful that, that actually I, I would imagine that the fiction writing is actually what helps to fuel what you're able to do for organizations am I right you know uh, that's interesting I hadn't really thought about that but I think you're right uh, because I read about a book a day I'm a prolific reader and I read in all genres Mm -hmm. And um, it always, every book challenges my thinking, forces me to look at things in new ways. Mm -hmm. And I have tried very hard to apply that to what I do for the nonprofit sector. Right. Because quite frankly, nonprofits who aren't willing to think differently, they're not going to make it. They're just not going to be there. And our communities are going to suffer because of that. Right. If you're a nonprofit leader, an executive director, a board member, uh, even a volunteer, and you're listening to this and you're realizing, I have got to do something about my organization, Maryland's the place to go. <laughs> ML Donnellan, D O N N E L L A N dot com. On the podcast, I'll put the link in the show notes. But uh, Marilyn, thank you so much for for taking some time out of your schedule to talk with us. You them. are very welcome. Thank you, Scott. All right. This has been another exclusive interview as part of the excellent series where we dig into life and see what we can find to become more excellent with greater clarity. My name is Scott Kokenauer. I'm so glad you've taken out time out to tune in. I'll see you on the next exclusive conversation.